What I mean is that whereas uh, if five people have five different ideas about what to do about the ghetto, yeah. um, in some sense we can fight it out in the newspaper or, you know, we can be generalists who kind of read history and read sociology and we can fight it out. Mm -hmm. And we can at least think that we're kind of on an even footing. I mean, again, as mm -hmm. I say, I don't necessarily share all your evaluations of these sociologists sure. that you write about in your book. Uh, sometimes I think you underestimate them. But in any case, you can, you know, you're at least in the game. Right. Whereas if we were doing something that was more technical and more specialized, mm -hmm. something that where, uh, you know, it was really possible definitively to know more and prove more, mm -hmm. right? Because you did control experiments or because you developed a theory mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. And where you were evaluated by your peers, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that someone had tenure at Berkeley or Stanford or Chicago yeah. would weigh in. And the reason it would weigh in is because you think that the vetting that those institutions do actually has information that uh, the typical person on the street wouldn't have. Yeah. So it's something about, about how expertise gets parsed in different institutional settings. Mm -hmm. I mean, one reason I'm suspicious of, of think tank research sometimes and of uh, the, the sort of programs that are being pushed there. Mm -hmm is that I think uh, people are trying to make an end run mm -hmm. around uh, what is really a very necessary vetting process, like peer review oh, of your research yeah. at journals and things of this kind. They're making an end run around that. And then there, uh, uh, Charles Murray, I think of, in his work on intelligence is a classic example of this. Yeah. And then they sort of defend themselves by saying, well, those are a bunch of politically biased people anyway, why should I have to submit to their view? When in fact the issue is, was your statistical analysis accurate? Were your data actually saying what you said that they said? Oh. Did you really identify causality in the ways that you claimed? Oh dear. You know, yeah. things like that. Oh yeah. You say oh dear, why? Because <laughs> un unfortunately, sometimes, Glenn, based on the world that we actually live in, the America that we actually live in, the academics, despite the statistics, and you know, God bless statistics, are not necessarily correct, and the way that we know this is not because of how the numbers come out, but because of how society comes out. And so, for example, you mentioned Charles Murray, and yeah. there's the bell curve. But what about losing ground, which was yeah. the most notorious address of the problem with welfare as we knew it? Now, as far as I know, the Academy was not terribly interested in the idea of a true, from the ground up, reform of the way welfare was working, such as what we've had since 1996. And there was a great deal of work showing what sorts of disasters might occur if we made any real changes. And statistics were able to show that. That's what statistics can do. Charles Murray had an idea, which certainly was not based upon the depth of analysis that, say, a Robert Greenstein had. But the media and the government yeah. picked up his ideas. And one thing we know now is that since 1996, black child poverty is down, more poor black women are working. It's not perfect, but I don't, think, perfect. I don't think that we can say that what happened in 1996 was wrong. I think it's agreed. No, that I think you're right. I think, and and I, I believe, frankly, um, John, that that is the view of at least the centrist uh, research community in economics and sociology and policy studies now. about welfare reform. Not perfect, now. but it uh, looks like it, on the whole, has been a change for the better. Right. But let me say a couple of things about Murray. I, I, I mean, Losing Ground was a very important book. I tell my students that the most influential social scientist, in so far as public policy is concerned, social policy, in the last That's true, uh, yeah. quarter of the 20th century is Charles Murray, and he never uh, held a chair at any of these fancy universities. And it's, he writes uh, extremely he's well. He's also brilliant, you must and, admit. Uh, and he's a very effective polemicist. But, but I think much of what was in Losing Ground, I want to say a couple of things. Much of what was in Losing Ground was wrong from a scientific point of view, in my opinion. That's true. Uh, I want to say also that welfare reform was also fueled intellectually by people like David Elwood, who was mm -hmm. my colleague at Harvard when I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, his book, Poor Support, was very influential, I know, on Bill Clinton's uh, thinking about welfare reform, and uh, Elwood then went on, along with Mary Jo Bain, his colleague, to serve in the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they had some differences with the way welfare reform finally came out, right. 
of a Republican Congress, mm. and they didn't uh, necessarily jump for joy when President Clinton signed that particular piece of and legislation. Clinton didn't really want to, right? He didn't, and it, it, it didn't have. It was a compromise, of course, as a piece of legislation might have to be when the president's a Democrat, exactly, and the Congress is in Republican control. But uh, also uh, people like Lawrence Mead, whom you may know. I don't know. I know, do you him know well. Yes. You know Larry Mead? Yeah. yeah, and he's a political scientist who's based in the academy, uh, who at NYU wrote these important books uh, from a relatively conservative point of view, although I always thought of Larry not as a conservative, as a realist mm -hmm. uh, in terms of his analysis. So, But that's just it, Glenn. Larry is often reviled. You know, he, 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 he's considered to be politically incorrect. No, I, I get that, and I'm, I want to cede that point. There is a problem in the academy of demanding fealty to certain political positions to the uh, um, detriment mm -hmm. of uh, the independence and the sort of free-ranging uh, kind of argument that you need. Mm -hmm. I think there are also many countervailing influences, not only in the think tanks, in the academy itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm here at Brown, and it's a hotbed of political correctness mm -hmm. and so forth. It fulfills all the stereotypes that might be in people's minds mm -hmm. out there about what a liberal Ivy League institution would be. On the other hand, I've got uh, staunchly conservative students mm -hmm. and, and uh, colleagues who are, you know, at the frontiers of their profession and who are respected. And, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that my students are being poorly served by coming here to study mm -hmm. in that they're going to be indoctrinated with some party line. Well, uh, Not if they don't want to be, not if they simply lift their heads up from the ground and look around because mm -hmm. the resources are here to counterbalance. But, you know, Glenn, there's so much involved where what we're really talking about is what students may not be taught. And so, for example, let's say that welfare reform has been a good thing, if a far from perfect thing, for the women that we're talking about. Now it's about the men. Now, as far as I can see, one of the most important aspects of helping the men is prisoner reentry programs. That has to become a new gospel among us. And I also feel that we really need to do something about the war on drugs because that has a lot to do with the high incarceration rates. Now, the last time, I, now, the last time I checked, what students are being taught in universities about race is still the same old business about the factories moving away, William Julius Wilson. We read uh, Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kozel with the myth that the reason that schools and minority communities don't do well is because they're not given enough money. It's that same sort of litany, and I don't think that a student would be hearing about, nor do I think that a grad student is encouraged to study, say, prisoner reentry efforts. Which ones work? Which ones don't? Not and true, Joe. On this? Is there really a dominant strain? Well, well dominant, I don't know. I mean, well, what, I can tell, what I can tell you is that uh, I teach an undergraduate class on crime and punishment here. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in prisons. I, I gave the Tanner Lectures and Human Values at Stanford earlier this year mm -hmm. on this subject. Uh, you know, I'm, I write books, too, and I'm mm -hmm. going to be writing about this. So, so uh, I teach my kids a lot. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about prison reentry issues. I bring people into the classroom who work in, you know, nonprofits around here in Providence and in other places. Mm -hmm. I bring in former prisoners mm -hmm. to talk to these people. I bring in prison guard union uh, and uh, prison administration officials to talk to them about what's actually going on. And I'll tell you this, and you'd be, I think, hardened to a certain degree. Uh, so I had a former inmate mm -hmm. uh, who's now out and working for one of these nonprofits mm -hmm. uh, come into my class and uh, talk about, uh, he had written a book called uh, uh, The New Jack's Guide to Life Inside Prison. Hmm. Okay, so he's an old head who's been in for eight years or whatever when he wrote it's this a book. And this book was, or an older book? Uh, it's, I think it's probably the last five Something years. Like I don't think he's been out that long. Right. Uh, it's on my website uh, as one of the readings for my punishment course if a person wanted to look at okay. it. But what I'm saying is, he, the, one of the first things he said to the students, he says, you're going to hear all about root causes arguments mm -hmm. uh, in uh, classes like this. Mm -hmm. And he says, I think they have their place. But I'll tell you one thing. When I'm talking to somebody who is not yet in prison or who just got out, mm -hmm. I never talk to them about root causes. Mm -hmm. I never talk to them about, you know, large-scale social forces or whatever, whatever. What I talk to them about is, are you going to the GED class tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Because that's the only thing that matters yep, and that idea. for that guy. Is, is he, is he going to get up 
and go to the class. That perspective is out there on the vine. I think so more and more. And Bill I'm saying it's at Brown. That's the point I want to make is that the, the kids who are coming yeah. to the liberal bastion of Ivy League uh, political correctness are getting that okay. in their classroom. In your particular classroom, and because you are brilliant, you have sense enough <laughs> oh, to do that. God, but, and I mean it. But the fact is, how do you think what that prisoner said would go over at a sociology conference? You know, everybody would hem and haw and sputter and say that they, there's something they patronize him probably. They pat him on the head yeah, and they metaphor and they say, yeah, show. thanks for coming, but right, you know, no one would take him seriously. Yeah, and I think that that is very much a reality about the very small realm of academia, except for a few people who know how to think for themselves. And that is what worries me about what academics have to tell us about race at this point. But let me